the first article is kind of what it means to be a Greenspan DR therapist. Um, you know, this is very different than what's out in the community. I know some of you may already have acknowledged that through reading the article or from even participating in our previous um, lectures, but it was important. This has actually been, this is one of the oldest articles. Um, well, I wrote this probably over 10 years ago, to be quite honest with you. Um, and it's been on our Floor Time Center website for a long time because I wanted parents who came to us to know what our therapists were going to be doing with their child and how they were going to all be working together on a common set of goals, um, as opposed to what some of the other therapists out in the world saying they're doing floor time are doing. Um, now, for those of you who may be working with some of those people or know those people, and if you if you know them, if you disagree with what I'm saying, please share that. Let me know that you know they are doing the things written in this article. But I'd like to open the floor for someone else to kind of comment on what some of their takeaways from this first article were, or any questions you have or thoughts you have about it. Does anybody want to get the conversation started? How about one of the new people who hasn't been on yet? I see some new some new names. I don't want to pick on you, but uh, can someone get the ball rolling for us? Here we go. Andrea, I'm a parent of a 12-year-old. Um, let's see. I'll read Andrea's question. Trying to use floor time techniques. When we have to say no, could you give me a couple examples of how you interact with them, negotiate? So, so Andrea, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer this. I really do want to kind of stick to the articles at first. Um, and, and I'll answer this, but I don't want to necessarily turn into a conversation just about talking about techniques um, yet. We can maybe do more of that at the end, but I'll, I'll certainly answer this question since you were bold enough to start the conversation and ask it. Um, the goal is to negotiate with them, right? The goal is to have a co-regulated interaction. So the goal is not to say no up front. The goal is to help them understand no or understand that you still care about how they feel. You care about what they want. You don't want to upset them, right? Your goal isn't to let them just know that life is tough and sometimes we got to accept no. And while that is the reality sometimes, that's not something we're going to be easily conveying to a child who has autism um, or anything else for that matter. Um, kids can learn that on their own. There'll be plenty of opportunities as I'm sure we all have experienced ourselves to learn those concepts. Um, so when we have to say no, the goal is to have a conversation. The first step in that conversation is listening. We need to hear what your child wants. And if they want to go outside, if they want to have a cookie before dinner, if they want to do something else they just can't do or they're not supposed to do yet, that's okay. We don't say no yet. We find out why. We use this as an opportunity to improve their logic, their communication, sustain their engagement, create a longer adaptive pattern of communication. Every opportunity when a child wants something is an opportunity for expansive communication. Remember that, especially when they want something strongly. And what we're trying to do is say, hey, I actually acknowledge and accept what you're feeling. I can even agree with how you feel, because I like cookies too, or I love going outside, you know, and playing with my friends. But, you know, what else do we have to do today? Or what do we usually have to do first? But and as we're doing that too, we may learn a reason for the child wanting something that we didn't know. And we actually may be able to address that reason versus the ultimate thing they're requesting. So when you think about what a child is asking for, Usually what a child's asking for, unless it's something very tangible, like a specific toy or um, or a specific food or something like that, well, sure, that may be the only thing that can meet their need. But usually when a child wants something or wants to do something, there's a deeper need to it, right? They're looking for some level of enjoyment. A child wants to go to a special park because that park has a special swing or a slide, or they had a lot of fun there last time because you played with them tag or chase. But the reality is it was the fun they're thinking of versus the park itself. So you need to be a bit of a detective by having that elongated conversation. If it is a rigid need, something more specific, we're going to try to create flexibility and compromise. But remember, a compromise isn't something we're going to tell a child they have to accept. 
a compromise is going to be an opportunity to help them develop flexibility. So what is flexibility? Not them accepting our idea, because that's just us being rigid and them being compliant. Flexibility is them coming up with an alternative idea. They want A, we want them to have, we want them to have C. Well, can they come up with B? Right. So the idea is they generate the alternative, this the adaptive solution, the new idea. That's what real flexibility is. And that's the goal of a compromise. If you have to set a boundary, set the boundary, but set it after the conversation. How's that? Um, any questions? Um, and again, we can talk about that concept. I'm happy to do that. I don't want to necessarily get into specific uh, situations quite yet, though. We can just save that for the end. Um, uh, uh, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, sure. Regarding for that first article. So I uh, was thinking, uh, what are the main distinguishing characteristics of a truly green span type of um, professional? Uh, to come to my mind and from that article I kind of I never got to the end of the book which I was trying to read engage in autism okay. um, but I was thinking so it has to be just to understand if, if it's truly a greenspan type of floor time it's uh, it has to be challenge challenging right um, it has to be who's doing the thinking what are the questions who uh, is the are they challenging who's doing the thinking and is there anything else that no, those I'm... are some of the big ones the other big one i would say is that they have to understand that there's not a separation between doing speech therapy and doing floor time or doing occupational therapy and doing floor time they always fit together if they're done correctly right we don't separate kind of sessions and unfortunately i've talked to therapists who said oh no i'm doing floor time today today i'm doing speech therapy I'm like, well, no, if you're actually doing it correctly, you're always doing floor time in conjunction with speech therapy or always doing floor time in conjunction with occupational therapy or physical therapy, because the goals of social emotional growth of keeping a child engaged and interactive should not be thrown out the window just because today I want to work on something specific that's going to cause a child to disengage. Well, if a child disengages, they're not learning, right? They're, you're not triggering neuroplasticity. So you can be a therapist checking goals off a sheet, but you're not doing any good for that child by doing it that way. So a true Greenspan floor time therapist knows that. Uh, uh, someone else who has this mixed perception in their mind that, hey, well, you know, certain things I have to be you know, this way about. Well, the truth is, no, you don't. Not if you want to really help that child at their core. Because as we know, the most important skill set that children can develop are the social emotional health set of skills and in conjunction with your individual therapist set of skills. And if your therapist set of skills don't map onto those social emotional goals, then you need to ask yourself a question. Is it the right time for those goals to be addressed? And that's a big question that therapists ask. Um, so my child's all sessions, OT and speech look the same, but I'm trying to see if they're doing enough. Um, if they look the same, it's pretty good. But if they look the same and it's disengaging and just wandering around the room, that's not good, right? If they look the same, it's highly interactive. There's a lot of adaptive responses, very engaged. Great. Then it's probably good sessions. If they look the same, but the child is just wandering around and the therapist is following them, which is what I see a lot, which is something else you said, Aya, where the th in a Greenspan floor time therapy session, that's integrated with speech, OT, or something else, there has to be not just following the child's lead, but there has to be challenges. You have to challenge the child to respond to you. You have to challenge the child to initiate, to socially problem solve, to continuously interact, to communicate, to think, et cetera. So if you're not challenging the child every step of the way to do that, then unfortunately, um, it's not necessarily a, a true session. Now, I'm not saying you can challenge a child a whole session, nor should you. You know, I just was working with a little girl this morning online who's um, in another state, and she just did IVIG yesterday, which she's been doing because she has a regressive form of Down syndrome, and she's been doing it. It's been very, very helpful for her. But a few days after that, she's more sensitive. So today we challenged her less, and it was great. She played in a rocking chair with her dad's beard, and her dad was giving her beard tickles and little buzzy beads. And that's all he was doing, but he got these smiles and these looks from her. And it was actually more interactive than any of us thought it would be, but he was actually challenging less and just being playful. So that's another great session. So the key is, again, making sure that we're integrating our goals and the social emotional never get 
um, tossed out that were always challenging the child um, within the session at the appropriate times at the appropriate developmental level. Um, and if we're in, we're and then we're expanding, right? If we're doing the, and the child's doing the thinking, right? So like you said, if those things are happening, then it's a very good green spin floor time session. Um, I think it is an interesting question. Common frustration for parents is that sometimes we see a, the therapist relating, but if we don't see challenging, we wonder if the therapist is just not creative enough or being lazy. Well, this is actually a real, I'm glad you're bringing this up because this is one of the things I've seen a lot from people who are not trained in my father's version of floor time. Remember, there's other versions of floor time out there that are not supported by Stanley Greenspan MD Inc., which is my father's company that uses his curriculum, that uses his materials. No other version of floor time has access to those things. So they can't use, they, we've offered them, they chose not to use them because they wanted to use their own internal things that they owned. Unfortunately, they were versions created by their own therapists. So it's kind of the six degrees of separation type situation. So unfortunately, things have been rewritten and a lot of things as they get rewritten lose parts of their meaning. And that's what's happening is a lot of therapists who do floor time, and I'm working with multiple therapists now from these other organizations who have left or planning on leaving these organizations because they want to learn how to actually do floor time. And in one or two of my training sessions with them, they see the massive differences in the application of floor time. The ideas are actually not that different we present. It's the application that ends up being very different. And so now this one therapist who's in, in you know in another state who is working with this little two-year-old um, who has all of these physical health challenges and developmental delays for the first time, and she's been working with him for a month, but for the first time he's looking at her and smiling at her. And he's giving her responses in the form of facial expressions and sounds for the first time. She's been working with him for like six months and she couldn't get any of that, because she was, but she was doing all the stuff she was taught to do. And she reached the advanced level of her training, but she couldn't get simple engagement and basic facial expression reciprocity from him, even after months and months and months of doing it. And then one training of learning to do floor time the correct way, my father's way, all of a sudden yielded these great results. And now she's hungry for more information, which is great. But she's seeing that applying floor time and knowing the information of floor time are two different things. And that's really what I think we try to focus so much on is the application. And that's why it's a, a lot of what you're learning. Um, yeah, I think it's it's hard to um, distinguish sometimes what good sessions and bad sessions are. Um, and, you know, even in my office, you know, my staff will think that, that sometimes there's a better session than there is. And I'll point something out and they'll be like, oh yeah, but that's part of the learning process, right? I mean, we all have to learn. I mean, I look back at some of my old sessions, everybody, and I cringe because I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought that was a good one. And it was for the time, to be quite honest, it was good. But now that I know more and in, in, in more in depth as to what to expect in a session, what I should be looking for, my expectations have changed. Um, and I think as you're learning this stuff, Certainly you have a little looser expectations, that's fine. But as you start practicing, and getting good at it, you should have higher expectations. And the same should be true of our, the therapist we work with. Any other thoughts or questions about that? Yes, I, I wanted to say, I really liked the article and uh, I was thinking the whole time, wow, this is the therapist I want for my kid. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, there, and I'll be honest, I mean, again, we, I think Shannon, again, who's one of the wonderful OTs at our office, um, she'll tell you, I mean, we try not to just hire people who have a resume that fits our needs, right? We rarely do that. I mean, Shannon kind of fell into our lap, wonderfully so, um, looking for additional training in floor time. <laughs> and I said, I can't really have you come observe, but if you want a job, come on board. <laughs> and she was like, really? <laughs> and, and it worked out. It was beautiful. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and to be honest, those are the perfect types of professionals who, for this stuff, people who are hungry for information, people who want to do this stuff the right way. And actually the therapists I'm mentioning who left or are leaving these other organizations, training them in floor time and working with Greenspan floor time is are people that I'm happy to train. I mean, I just met two wonderful OTs in South Africa 
who work with very low income populations. And they asked me for free access to my dad's um, online introductory training. And I, and I, I said, I, th- I mean, they wrote this heartfelt email and I couldn't tell if they're trying to manipulate me or not, but it worked either way. <laughs> and I set up a Zoom with them, not to test who they were, but just to see their their love and care. And I said, you're the people I want to train, right? And so these people are out there, but they're not everywhere and they're hard to find. And when you find them, you know, whether you got to drive an extra 30 minutes to get to them or whether you, you know, want to work with them online sometimes, whatever it is, you know, utilize them so that you can benefit from their knowledge and their passion right and it's that passion that i think is the difference not passion for just their their curriculum of ot or speech or something else but their passion for truly doing the best possible work they can and knowing that they're not naturally just going to be gifted to be the best possible therapist we all have to learn something new we all have to be self-critical we all have to be reflective I mean, my journey from when I was 24, starting this learning from my dad to now, I can't even tell you how painful it was, <laughs> but it was, but it was rewarding too. You know, it also made me wonder because you touched on it a few times and it sort of connects with the next article as well, floor time all the time, yeah. that you mentioned that uh, floor time is sort of a technique, but at the same time, in a way it becomes a lifestyle as well. But when in this article we talk about it that um, OTs and speech therapists um, use floor time, I was wondering like, is it does it have to be related to another profession? Like, um, couldn't yeah. someone just be a floor time therapist? Absolutely, great question. And actually, that is one of my, one of our beliefs of the Greenspan floor time um, approach and StanleyGreenspan.com that isn't always shared across the community. They actually won't certify at the same level non-licensed therapists in these other organizations when the reality is we'll certify anybody who's good enough to be certified because you don't Mm -hmm. have to have a license to be a good therapist or interventionist if you want us to call them that right because there's a lot of people who say they're not therapists well okay who cares (laughs) i know it's it's i care i care about our therapists but people who can pick that pick that argument i don't care about (laughs) um but but absolutely i mean we always say Floor time is both a standalone intervention as well as an integrated intervention. Meaning, in my father, when he wrote the first book he mentioned floor time in, he wrote it for parents. It was called The Essential Partnership, okay? It was for caregivers, not for therapists. So floor time in its creation was designed for parents, which means it is a standalone intervention, okay? But a parent-centered intervention or a paraprofessional-centered intervention, whoever whoever's carrying out the floor time, It also has to be supported by other therapists, too, because the same goals we're talking about should be nurtured and supported by speech, OT, educators, mental health professionals, physical therapists, whoever else is working with that child. Right. So we can have this really cohesive program. Um, And that's why we say it's both standalone and integrated. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I will have I I will follow up with this thought for the next article, I think, if uh, there's a chance. But. Yeah, it's, as uh, Ia wrote, like parents do it without a license, right? Like this is our job yeah. right now to yeah. to do it. And, and parents um, are the best floor timers. I mean, I I always I always tell parents that if if um, you know, the, if the, the 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 benefit from a parent doing and applying floor time is exponential. It's tenfold from a good therapist, even if the therapist is just good, if not better than you, because they've been doing it longer, right? Still, the experience that your child has with you in that relationship can't be replicated by another person and that's why it's so important yeah still i think we learn a lot when we see good therapists and they come up with ideas that we didn't think about it's always amazing uh like oh how did i not think of that and then you start doing that too and this actually leads me to another question um so many times we are shut out of sessions it's not allowed for you to be there to see what's happening so it sort of makes you wonder (laughs) what is the right approach good wonder and so we we have a policy at my office because i understand both sides of it coming from you know running a clinic seeing uh, we've had many parents who are overly intrusive and involved and, and actually interrupt sessions deliberately or they really actually literally cannot handle their child connecting with another person right that's the extreme 
right? Way, and then and that's not the only thing that we're that I think organizations like ours are trying to avoid. But also, in order for the child to connect with and build a relationship with that therapist, sometimes it just has to be the two of them, right? Having a parent mm -hmm. there is going to affect the child's ability to connect and relate with a new person if the parent can always be the main interest in the room or the main relationship in the room. In addition to that. Children do act differently around parents than when parents aren't there. And there's a lot of children who, when they know a parent is there, they become more melodramatic when being challenged than when the parent's not there, they overcome that challenge like that. <laughs> and I'm sure parents know that too, right? <laughs> they see their kids or they hear their kids when they're not around. They're like, oh yeah, I know he can do that. But when I'm not around, he just sits on the floor and waits for me to put his shoes on, right? <laughs> so, so all of those are factors, right? So, but what we do at our, at the floor time center is we try to find a happy medium. The first couple sessions, the parents should be there, especially if the child's young. We want the, parent, the child to feel safe and secure while forming and meeting a new person. But after a couple sessions, if the child seems comfortable with this new person, we want the parent to start phasing themselves out. Okay, so the child can get more comfortable with that therapist and build a firmer relationship. But then as we want parents to learn this as well, we do want the parents, if they want to be part of a session, to come back towards the end and actually be part of the session. Because the other thing that happens with a lot of parents is because parents are hungry for knowledge and want to learn, they end up wanting to talk to the therapist the whole session. <laughs> and <laughs> then, now the therapist is stuck between I'm trying to do this intervention and answering questions. And it's tough and they get burnt out and stressed. So it's all about finding the right balance. So we always say the last 15 to 20 minutes, if the parents want to come in, they're welcome to get there early and do that. And But we want them to participate in the session, not just sit on the sidelines and watch, right? Because we want them to learn. And sitting and watching is helpful. And I know every parent says, I, I learn better by watching. <laughs> but yeah, no. It's just more comfortable because you don't feel stressed exactly. so much. Exactly. <laughs> and so... But <laughs> no, I, uh, it's not you. We're not talking about you asking too many questions. Um, but, um, but the, the idea is also that we want parents to engage in pure coaching sessions as well, right? I want a parent, we do 25 minute coaching sessions. So it's not like a whole hour. It's not a whole thing, but I do them even virtually. Like I mentioned this family in Mississippi, I'm doing them weekly with them for the last six months. And this little girl is night and day from where she started. She's seven years old with regressive Down syndrome. Um, and so, you know, it, it, there are other ways to learn it that are highly effective for people that are, whether it's with me or even some of my staff to do these things or other people in the community. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you for the questions. Um, let's, let's move on to that second article, everybody, since we're at about the 630.